Can I welcome David Crow to the stage? He's the Chief Political Correspondent for the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age and a regular commentator, as I'm sure all of you know, on national affairs on the ABC Insiders program on Radio National and on the Nine Network. And he'll be conducting our next session. He'll, of course, introduce our esteemed guest, Professor Tanya Munro. Welcome, David. Thanks, Katrina. Uh, and thank you all for having me here at the conference where I don't think I really belong. I write about the low arts of politics and I'm not sure that should get me entry to a summit about higher learning, but I'm here uh, and thank you. Uh, my job here is to rise above the politics and ask our keynote speaker about the challenges Australia is facing and how our scientists and our universities uh, are going to deal with that challenge. So let me introduce our speaker. Tanya Munro is the country's chief defence scientist and a physicist who has been recognised with great awards over the past two decades. For the past four years, she's been the head of the Defence Science and Technology Group within the Department of Defence. Before that, she was Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research and Innovation at the University of South Australia, and earlier, Director of the Centre for Excellence of Nanoscale Biophotonics at the University of Adelaide. She's been a researcher at the University of Southampton, was awarded the Bragg Gold Medal for the best physics PhD in Australia when she completed her doctorate, at the University of Sydney. And that was the start of many awards, including a Companion of the Order of Australia last year. So there's plenty to discuss. Let's get straight into it. I'll ask Tanya to make some opening remarks, I think, from the chair. And then we'll move on to a discussion about the future of universities, the next steps in advanced research, and a whole lot more. I'll want your questions from the audience. Um, hopefully the screen works. Um, unmoderated questions, so far away. Um, after some discussion, we'll then throw to you, um, and then we'll wrap up in time for uh, morning tea. So uh, over to you, Tanya. Thank you very much, David. Can everybody hear me? Wonderful. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, and I thank the Universities Australia for this invitation to talk to you at a absolutely pivotal time in terms of the intersection of the future of our nation's wonderful universities and defence. And today I'd just like to share some brief opening remarks and then we can have a conversation. Because universities are critical to so many of the challenges we have ahead of us, whether that's workforce, our research and development and beyond. And what I'm going to touch on is really our context, some of the wins we've had to date, and challenge you to challenge me. Because while I think we've made wonderful progress in the last few years, we've really got to up our game to cope with what's ahead. So some context. Um, nobody in this room will have missed the really quickly shifting sands of geopolitics. Warning times have reduced, and indeed you could argue that we're constantly in grey zone conflict with the rate of cyber challenge to our businesses, our institutions. Um, this requires a really different approach to the nation's defence, and those who saw our Prime Minister's national security speech last night, or indeed Mike Burgess's comments the night before, um, head of ASIO, we'll just know how important this is and, and how much time it's taking of our government at the moment to think about the future. The PM flagged that defence and national security were the first and foremost priority of any government. Uh, and our Deputy Prime Minister, Minister Miles, has flagged that we have a defence workforce crisis. So I'm going to touch on some of those elements, but I'll enjoy a conversation. Universities are absolutely critical, and the context we're in is where we need to harness more of what our universities do for defence's highest priority challenges. We've made a good start down that road. Back in 2020, we launched More Together, the Defence Science and Technology Strategy, and can I just for this moment around nomenclature say that in the land of defence, nomenclature can be strange and wonderful, and I sometimes feel I need to be a bit of a translator. Science and technology means R&D in the context of universities. It does not include the social sciences, the humanities, other ways of creating and applying knowledge. In the creation of the More Together strategy, we identified that we needed to help our universities and our industry focus on those highest priority defence problems, that we needed to build scale around them, 
And really, we identified that my organisation, Defence Science Technology Group's core role is in elevating partnerships, deep, long-term partnerships, not short-term pieces of work to get money out the door by the end of the financial year, but decadal partnerships to make sure that we are together doing the basic research, the applied research that gets after some of the biggest, wickedest problems defence faces. The most obvious instantiation of that was the creation of eight star shots in blatant homage of the Kennedy moonshot, which are owned and sponsored by our uniformed service chiefs at at least the three star chief of service level. And they are problem statements. They're no longer technology pushes. We're not simply saying we need more AI, we need more quantum, we need more advanced materials. We're saying this is our problem. Smart people of our nation help us solve it. This encourages an interdisciplinary approach. It encourages creativity. It encourages partnership. At the same time, we've been working this agenda, and I have to say I've been thrilled with the response of the sector, but there is more we can do. And while I don't have time in these opening comments, I'll just briefly pay tribute to some of the really significant shifts I've seen across our universities in response to this new strategy. They range from, for example, the focus of one of the thrusts of the smart satellite CRC on defence problems. The Defence Trailblazer recently established at University of Adelaide in UNSW directly responds to four of those eight star shots. We have wonderful examples of clever things our universities do are doing, big and small, applying to defence. Perhaps one of the most wonderful examples recently is we've been changing our approach to wargaming and using some clever technology from one of our universities to avoid the old-fashioned notion of turn-by-turn role-play, which really doesn't represent what happens in the grey zone. So there are wonderful examples of our partnership, but I see that to meet the challenges ahead, we need to lift this up a level. At the same time we've been doing this, um, we've been working very hard to transform De Defence Science Technology Group. We celebrated our 115th birthday last year, and our role has changed profoundly over the last decade. Predominantly a decade ago, DSTG was primarily valued by government as a source of deep exper experts that could provide technology risk evaluation on acquisition. Now, that is important. We need to make sure we're really smart buyers when we buy military technology from overseas. But when you have those very smart people, you're missing an opportunity if you don't find a way to identify the niche things we're really good at here in Australia and how we can build sovereign industry around them, involve our universities in developing things here in Australia we can export to the world and that can be interoperable with allied technology we get from our partners. So I've been driving quite a um, bolshy transformation of the group that resulted in significant structural change last year and um, we have been, in a way, rewarded for that change and that transformation by being given an elevated role within the defence ecosystem. So my role as Chief Defence Scientist sits as a Deputy Secretary within the department, and one of the things I most enjoy about this role is, while I'm responsible for a wonderful research organisation, I sit at that senior defence table being part of that leadership of the enterprise. I'm Capability Manager for Innovation Science and Technology across the department, and DSTG provides the leadership for the department in our relationship with all our nation's universities. So if there's anyone here with an interest and engagement in defence that does not know who your executive relationship partner is for defence, it's one of my senior leaders, and they're accountable not just for making sure we're doing the most high-priority work together, and not just lots of little things, but also for making sure that we have the right relationships across the broader defence enterprises with your universities. So very, very briefly, um, I'd like to just touch on some of the really big things that are occupying my mind, in a sense to give you a heads up on where things are going. Some of these will be no surprise to you whatsoever. So as you would have seen last week, 
government was handed the Defence Strategic Review, which was an independent review led by Professor Stephen Smith and Sir Angus Houston. They were tasked to look at the future force posture, to look at what capabilities decisions needed to be made, including hard decisions on what needs to be stopped, what needs to be accelerated, what needs to be done differently. And we're in the process of looking to how we can support that and make the changes required. This is not a mild tweak. This is quite a dramatic transformation. I'm also responsible for supporting government in delivering their election commitment on ASRA, the Advanced Strategic Research Agency, which is now being known by the name of ASCA, Advanced Capabil Strategic Capabilities Accelerator, and I'll come to that word in a second, because the government's intent as you'll hear more from government once it's fully made uh, the announcements around ASCA, is to accelerate the delivery of capability and get it into the hands of the warfighter faster. Because there's no point us admiring the problems and coming up with perfect solutions that may be delivered too late to be useful. But I'd also say that our warfighters are deeply intelligent, capable, well-trained people and can come up with really clever ways of using emerging disruptive technology, but we need to get it into their hands in trials and exercises and not get stuck in admiring the problem and developing perfect solutions. There's a wonderful example of this new way of working I wanted to share with you before I finish my opening remarks and pass across to David to drive the conversation. Some of you may have seen the announcement of a new program called the Ghost Shark. The Ghost Shark is a new class of uncrewed submarine that we in Australia here are developing that for me is an exemplar of this new way of working that has at its heart two core concepts that I plan to use post the government's decisions on DSR to refresh the more together strategy. And those two core concepts are acceleration, that piece I talked about, about getting emerging disruptive tech into the hands of the warfighter, and asymmetry. So a brief word on asymmetry, because this is something I would love to harness the brains of our academics across the nation on. Asymmetry is about a shift in mindset from capability gaps, of which there are many and plenty. If we take a capability gap mindset, we will never have enough people. We will never have enough funding. But asymmetry is about what can we have in Australia that cannot easily be defeated by simply applying scale from a potential adversary, whether that's funding, people, mm -hmm. capability, scale. What are the intelligent choices we can make to deter actions against our interests through thoughts around asymmetry? So briefly, to close off my comments on Ghost Shark, these uncrewed submarines are not a case of a company coming and selling us an idea in Australia, paying fully to buy that idea. What they are is it's a concept that is going to be co-developed between a new company set up in Australia called Andural Australia, over 30 SMEs, I hope deep relationships and partnerships across our universities, which are just starting. We are co-funding this dollar for dollar with, from money from the Next Generation Technology Fund. And Navy is our partner standing side by side with us. It's not a research project. It's delivering three operational prototypes into the hands of Navy, which will be used instantly to explore the art of the possible. And we together will be looking at how we can bring payloads in from those SMEs, those clever ideas from our universities. Just as last year, in fact, we had a wonderful demonstration of Australia's edge in quantum technologies when our Five Eyes nations all contributed their best in breed quantum sensor technologies and we demonstrated them in a maritime environment on a New Zealand frigate. And it's wonderful to be able to share with you that some of the Australian tech, both from our universities and our industry, outperformed other best in world technologies, which really helps cement our edge in quantum. So that's where I'll stop with my opening comments. I hope I've given you a sense both of our context but also our intent, and I really look forward to a conversation. Thank you very much. Um, 
That's fascinating, all of that. Um, but I have a very quick question to begin because I'm intrigued by the ghost sharks. I hadn't prepared any question about the ghost sharks. I, I, I just want to visualise them. Are they small, like basically an underwater drone, or are you talking about something much more substantial? Well, I won't share specs. Um, I will give you a sense. I'm already into classified information. No, am I? no. And look, I'm uh, just as a slightly humorous side note. I sort of feel like one of my top jobs is actually finding ways that we can talk about things that are classified in mm. ways that have meaning. Because, you know, more than half my workforce works at top secret security classification, yeah. and I think historically that meant we were invisible. Yeah. I don't think we need to be. Yeah. And I think there's many examples where I'm learning we can find ways of talking about it. Truck-sized. Truck-sized, okay, good. I'm getting the, <laughs> getting the picture. But I would, let's move on to some of the, the, the big issues. You mentioned the Defence Strategic Review. Um, we're waiting for a, um, I guess, a redacted version of that to be released publicly. That's something that Anthony Albanese promised yesterday in his speech to the National Press Club. So we will get to see a declassified version of that report, which will obviously get a lot of debate going about the future, and that will have so many implications for university and for research. We already know that workforce is a big element of that. In fact, there have been stories about an entire chapter of that review being devoted to workforce. Um, I know that you're very energised by this issue about the workforce. So um, what is that going to mean for the university sector, for researchers across the country, in terms of developing the workforce that's going to be needed for the decades ahead? How, how <laughs> are we anywhere close to having the workforce that we're going to need? The short answer is no. This is a burning platform and we need your help. Um, I'd just love to give you some numbers to paint the scale of the current workforce situation. And while I can't talk about details of what's in the DSR until it comes out from government, um, it's only going to get worse. <laughs> because if we're to accelerate and make significant changes in the capability plan, that's going to need more workforce in these areas. So if I paint the picture of the current burning platform and say it's going to intensify, I think you'll see how important this sector is. So currently, as of January this year, Defence employs 116,000 people across Australia. And of those 116,000, 16,000 are Australian public servants, and the rest are either reserves or um, full-time military. The ADF itself is currently about 3,000 people below its allocated force strength. And we see that thinness challenging many of the things we need to do. We already have an agreed plan with government that we will increase our workforce pre dsr by 30% by 2040, with an increase of 18,500 on that baseline workforce. Now, to give a sense of where right now we're feeling the pain and really finding that a combination of factors from really small pipelines of people coming through our universities in certain areas, right through to increased competition from other sectors who all want the same kind of skills, to the fact that just frankly, you know, while the mission we, you know, address in defence is really compelling and provides great reward and job satisfaction to our people, it often can't compete in financial terms around remuneration. But to give you a sense, we work very hard to track our critical occupations, occupations in which we have recurrent, long-standing issues in recruitment and retention. And if I list the ones that are currently in the, the latest 2023 assessment identified as critical, they're ICT business analysts, enterprise architects, project managers, communications specialists, psychologists, cyber specialists, that one won't surprise you strategic and international policy experts, capability analysts, engineers of pretty much every flavour, but mm. specifically um, from executives to electronics engineers, systems engineers and mechanical engineers. If I add that on top of the context of the clear commitment this government has to reducing government's use of contractors, which is across the whole of the public service, this will become more acute. Um, and I would love to see some of the work done on the Accord. Seeing how we can change incentives for our universities, both in teaching and in research, 
to recognise, reward, encourage, put the policy foundations for universities to be able to help deliver to those areas of greatest government priority. Because we know some of the things that have happened in recent years, like the differential help hex levels for yeah. different courses, haven't changed the student demand piece. One other thing I will say too is, I'm chair of the Defence STEM Council, because one thing you might not realise is more than 40% of military roles are STEM based in terms of expertise, and more than 30% of our civilian roles. And what I see inside defence, if I look across our groups and services in defence, is a microcosm of our broader nation. We have around about 150 incredibly well-intentioned STEM programs that range from primary schools to the mid-career. They are fabulous. As I said, it's a microcosm. Our nation has thousands of these programs and has had since I was a kid at school. But we still have a profound problem with less than 10% of our kids doing higher level maths in year 11 and 12. So there are things we need to shift and do dramatically. And my sense is defence is one of the few places that has the scale to do something transformative in that space. Some of those skills that you need, ICT, project management, um, it seemed like a list that I could hear from an IT systems integrator operating in Canberra trying to scoop up graduates to do that consulting work. So it, it's a very competitive um, field. But one other thing that we're about to get from the government is, of course, the AUKUS decision on nuclear-powered submarines. And I'm also wondering about the workforce needed to support that, um, because it's not clear to me um, whether we've got, where, or how many nuclear scientists we might need to support that. Are we talking about a whole new level of skill set that we have to start developing now so that it's going to be ready in 15 to 20 years' time? We're almost talking about an entire shift in a, within a generation of the kind of graduates we produce and the scientists we, we need. Yes, David, we do. We mm. need an uplift in this nation's science and technology career pipeline to support the nuclear-powered submarine intent. And we've been working incredibly closely within Defence, very tightly across the Nuclear-Powered Submarine Task Force, Defence Science Technology Group, across the whole enterprise, really, to understand that requirement. It's important to note that while the thing front of mind, I guess, to many thinking about this really significant shift for Australia, will be the nuclear expertise and the fact that Australia doesn't have a civil nuclear industry, and it is important. But one thing that is also worth raising is that there are other very significant uplifts required across a broad range of engineering and related areas that are also generational. So we now have a good sense of the uplift required. Um, and we really look forward to working with this sector post-government announcement of the preferred pathway for acquisition of nuclear-powered submarines to drive that uplift. I would say that the comment I made before around the Accord being a once-in-a-generation opportunity to try and get the policy settings right applies to this as well, because I think we need to work in a differentiated way across the sector, finding out where there is already a nucleus that we can build around, because I think we all know that, particularly in R&D, it takes 10 plus years to build critical mass and excellence in a new field. So we're not looking to have nuclear science, nuclear engineering pop up across all of our nation. We need a few well-supported centres, but that does not mean that other universities miss out because the uplift, as I said, required in related but non-nuclear areas is also significant. Okay. Now, your, your field is photonics and physics, um, where, by the way, you would have been scooped up by any number of um, uh, Silicon Valley type companies. Uh, um, uh, but what's your... And you, you work through universities um, with that skill set, doing advanced research. What's your view of the research pathway now um, and whether it's producing the advanced scientists uh, that we need now or that we need in the future? Thanks, David. My view is that we do have um, a career path crisis in our research career structures in Australia. We do have relatively few institutions and roles for our very best scientists that offer that job security. 
Still, much of our nation's research sits on the back of fantastic postdoctoral researchers or people on, still on one and two year contracts. I have many friends and colleagues that I went through PhDs with who were still on one or two year contracts. Mm. There's fundamental change we need to consider and I, I know that questions like covering the full cost of research are questions that need to be grappled with in the current policy context. On a slightly um, more upbeat note, you know, um, I sit on the board of CSIRO and, you know, it's a wonderful organisation that offers, you know, career security to a reasonable workforce. As a group head of Defence Science Technology Group, one of the things I was puzzling about as we tried to deliver our more together strategy is that almost all of my organisation is not like me. Most of the folk that come in and come up to senior roles came in as cadets or graduates and have lived inside defence and defence science ever since. And with the best intent of the world, in the world, how could my organisation drive the change we need across our nation if the people doing it, on the whole, didn't understand what it was like to walk in the shoes of a university academic, postdoc, industry innovator? So we tried an experiment last year. And this experiment I commend to you and I'd encourage you to read up about, it's called the Navigate Program. And the concept, the thought experiment was, let's create a mid-career grad program. Let's invite people that are five to 15 years post a PhD, qualification or equivalent experience, and say, are you attracted by the defence mission? Do you want to drive impact through your research? Apply, do not worry if you can't see exactly where you might fit within defence and where you can contribute. Because I'd realised that even when we were advertising mid-career roles, we rarely got the right kind of people applying. Because if, you know, you were applying to do something called, you know, non-acoustic signatures, how would you know what that was if, you know, you had not worked in defence? So we, I was thrilled with the response to the Navigate inaugural call last year. We got nearly 900 applicants. We had a groundswell from within DSTG when my staff realised that not only were we bringing in people from outside, but we were putting around it a mobility program, I'll talk about that in a sec, but a development, a cohort-based development program. And so we decided to open it to high potential internal. So the way it works is if you're a successful navigator and you come in from the external community, you do six, two six-month rotations anywhere in defence or my part of defence, and then we work with you to find you your next place. And actually, defence is a very mobile workforce. People tend to build careers across different domains. The people from within the group that win them go out into your universities, into your industries. You probably have a few now. You just might not know you have them. We're going to run it again this year. I think it's a significant step change in trying to connect our national system better, because it all comes down to people. You can have the best strategic ideas in the world, and if in reality our organisations are filled with people who are trying to sell each other things but don't understand how it is to work in each other's organisations, I think we're doomed. Um, a quick question there, because um, I don't understand the career pathways or what life is like for a postdoc researcher. Um, but if you know, you're hungry for skilled researchers, good PhDs, does that mean that you sometimes have to compete with the universities? You, you've got people who are, who've done their PhDs, they're in universities, they've got a difficult pathway, um, contracts, short-term contracts. In a sense, you become a reliable employer and a better future for them. I mean, in some ways, um, that's a competitive, a source of competitive tension that Australia's research community as a whole, when you look at it, could probably do without, because the universities need some of those skills as well. I both agree and disagree with you, but it's a great question. Um, one point I would make is, yes, the reason we got such a groundswell of applicants for Navigate is because many of them were those, you know, vulnerable postdocs having been in that position for a while, but some were tenured academics. I don't see us as competing with universities. I think this sector is doing a really good job through a range of mechanisms to try and shift the sights of people who do PhDs. 
from being the traditional, I do a PhD because I want to be just like my professor. I mean, I've, I've successfully supervised through to completion nearly 50 PhD students. And almost every one of them, when I asked them, why are you doing this? You'd essentially get an answer that was, I want to do what you do. Mm. And you know, we all know that only a really small proportion of those PhDs go on to be our university tenured professors. So I think um, it is really, really important that we give our PhD students that broader sense of where they can contribute and that it's not a failure not being an academic researcher in a university, but you can make a huge difference through that PhD training. So I don't think we compete with universities. I think we offer alternative and se secure career paths. But in my view, I want more mobility. And that mobility can be joint appointments, that can be secondments. Um, I don't worry, as I know some of my predecessors had worried pr uh, before, about losing our good people, because I think if our people go out into the system understanding our world, they're advocates and they help drive change. I have a question about um, whether we're seeing a changing face of the young people who are coming through now into this kind of research, because I uh, read a profile of you and I believe that when you were a student, an Australian physics professor actually discouraged you from doing a PhD in physics because of your gender. And you went ahead and won the medal for the best physics PhD. Have attitudes changed enough since then? I think we've still got a way to go. I think that too often women and girls have a confidence gap and make decisions based on the response of the world around them to their choices. I have learnt that far too many of the very senior women in our universities, particularly in STEM but not exclusively in STEM, have a very narrow personality profile of being a bit like me, being really stubborn and determined. If someone tells me I can't do something, I'm probably more likely to go on and do it because I like a challenge. But personality doesn't correlate to talent and capacity to contribute. And so I just see it as a personal mission really, uh, and I know many here do too, to try and change our cultures so that um, the ability to contribute really determines your, your propensity to stay and be promoted. I think we've got a way to go. Um, I think partly it's about women and girls um, and parents and careers counsellors understanding um, how some of these choices of studying STEM subjects and entering STEM careers actually can be extraordinarily fulfilling and you can make a difference. Um, but it's as much about also getting more of our boys into that pipeline. Um, one of the big issues at this conference is <clears throat> the future of universities because of the O'Kane report. Um, and the reviews that are going on this year. And I know that one of the subjects that I've been hearing about is whether there's a sameness in all our universities, whether there's a different future where universities differentiate more, um, focus on different things, um, uh, rather than all looking the same. And I'm very interested in your view of that after your experience of coming through the university system and now sort of sitting with it, but also outside it. Mm. I, I'll start by saying that our universities absolutely have a role to play in terms of encouraging, nurturing curiosity in our researchers. But I do think that Australia is too undifferentiated in terms of the capabilities in our universities. Our universities are largely similar. They vary in terms of scale of research intensivity, and of course some universities have particular strengths, all do, but it is too undifferentiated from where I sit. Um, where I view um, Australia's universities as having the potential to really help Australia in this mission to accelerate the delivery of asymmetric, really, um, deterrence to protect our sovereignty, we require more scale. We, we require that understanding at a university to university level of the three, four areas where we're in it for the long haul together, where there's decadal plus type partnerships, where we know what the Horizon 3 long-term research thrusts are, but we also know how to pull the experts into the Horizon 2 or the Horizon 1 to help get after the short-term opportunities. 
and where we then can create the critical mass of graduates coming through that then can feed into defence industry as well as defence proper. So I think we've got a I think we've got an opportunity now that we must take with the University Accord to try and support universities here in this room to drive to that greater differentiation, acknowledging that there are ge geographic considerations and offerings for students need to be broad in jurisdictions. But because of Australia's concentrated population bases, I think there's a mature way we can figure out who does what. In a practical way, does that mean that in the future there should be centres of excellence at the universities Adel in Adelaide that might not belong in Brisbane? That they Correct. have to focus. Okay, Correct. so it seems logical to me that we're heading into a world where um, you'll need more. Well, the nuclear sub powered submarines are going to be based in or built in Adelaide, so therefore there's a. Isn't it logical that Adelaide should build up that capability? Look, there there are geographic links that come both from capability locations, but also just from where you guys have absolute strength. You know, one example I'd give is just last year we opened our hypersonics precinct in Queensland, um, which is a partnership between Defence, a number of industry partners, University of Queensland, University of Southern Queensland. Yeah. It is really a way of bringing together the leading in researchers in certain areas around key infrastructure in order to get after things faster and harder, and that's important. In Adelaide, there's a real focus, particularly at the University of Adelaide, in information warfare or information sciences in order to help us get after that, that challenge that I talked about earlier. Whereas, you know, differentiation at the University of South Australia, they won the bid to lead our defence AI network, which is a national way of essentially making sure that defence knows the right people to go to across the university and industry ecosystem in AI, which obviously moves fast. One thing I will say briefly is one mechanism that I think will become increasingly important will become is the defence state-based research networks. So depending on which state or territory you're in, these will have different names. It's the DIP, the DIN, the DSI, uh, you know, there's, there's different ones in every state. They're all partnerships with the local state governments. In each of them, the associate director is one of my secondees, and what they're there to do is be the feet on the ground that connect the intellectual capacity in each location with the defence questions, so, because not everyone's in Canberra. All right, so state so, political leaders will also be making this, these strategic decisions about where they focus. Correct. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, now we've got plenty of questions. Uh, we've got just less than eight minutes to go. I'm trying to keep to time. Uh, one of the questions here is about something that you know, is such a big issue over the last year. Obviously, it's the Ukraine war. And it is, what has the Ukraine war taught us about the importance of science and technology leadership in the defence space? And I think that links in with something that you addressed, which is asymmetric, asymmetrical conflict. I mean, that's one of the big lessons out of, out of Ukraine. Uh, what lessons do you take out of what's happened over the last year? That's absolutely right. The other is speed to be able to get that emerging disruptive technology into the field. In, in a sense, the minimum viable capability, being able to um, get capabilities into the hands of the warfighter and see how that can change the calculus of war. Um, of course, you know, the main thrust of what we do is to try to avoid getting to that point, but once we do, we've got to be able to operate. I, I think what it's shown us is actually, I think it's lifted confidence in asymmetry. You know, many would have thought at the beginning of that war that the result was a foregone conclusion. Mm. And both the tenacity of the Ukrainian people, the support of alliances, actually, that gives me the chance to say one thing we haven't touched on in this conversation, and I won't speak for long on it, but I cannot say strongly enough how important our partnerships with our allies are. We haven't talked about AUKUS and AUKUS Pillar 2 here. Um, but our deep interconnectedness, interoperability, but deep science and technology partnerships, both with the US, the UK, the Five Eyes, Japan, Republic of Korea, Singapore, etc., are absolutely pivotal. What I am seeing is a shift into greater willingness from our key allies to actually say, you know, Australia's really good at that. We'll just use their strength in this and not have to replicate it. Okay, but that raises something that um, is also inescapable, China. 
Um, and you've addressed geopolitics in your opening remarks. Now, geopolitics is inescapable at the moment. In research, it raises these questions about whether United States researchers, whether the NSF can work with China um, uh, over time on research. The CHIP Act in the US is all about um, domestic uh, strength in advanced science on semiconductors. What implications does that have for universities and research in Australia about who we can work with? This is a big subject and could be a whole 45 minute panel, so I'll try to do the one two minute version. It's absolutely critical that any edge we have in Australia can be used for Australian interests. And this sector knows that. And this sector has been engaging with that in many ways, both through things like following the guidelines from the UFIT task force, right through to signing up to the Defence Industry Security Policy, or the DISP program. And indeed, in doing that, many of your organisations have increased the numbers of your people, including at senior levels, who are security cleared. Mm. And one thing I think we need to get better at is really using that to make sure those with appropriate clearances can get appropriate threat briefings and really understand the nature of the challenge. On working with China, you know, they're becoming a research powerhouse in many areas and are investing incredibly heavily. That is something we need to grapple with maturely. And not all areas of research are equally problematic from the point of view of Australia's interests and protecting Australia's interests. Certainly in my area, it's a lot more challenging than it is in, in other areas. And we need different protections. So I think we need the right type of protections that fits the nature of the risk and not a blanket, we don't work with China, because that wouldn't make sense. Exactly, so in some fields, it can be encouraged, cooperation can go ahead. If they've got some of the best researchers in the world working on things that we care about, then it would be foolish to do otherwise. Yeah. Okay, now one of the questions from the audience is that it's important to acknowledge that there is a challenge in securing a domestic pipeline of PhD students to work on defence projects. So how can your group help in solving that pipeline issue? I'd actually, rather than give you an answer, because I think there are probably a number of answers, I don't think there's one magic bullet here, I'd love to trigger this conversation. I'm seeing some trends, such as people coming back and doing PhDs at later or mid-career stages, rather than just seeing it as something that's part of the undergraduate to postgrad pipeline. We do have a problem um, in ha not having enough domestic students. Um, I would love to hear suggestions from the sector on how we could do that better. That relates to one of the other questions, I think, from the audience, which is, uh, and these are all anonymous, um, what are your views on upskilling or reskilling the existing workforce? Is it, I mean, some of this, some of this science is very advanced. I mean, even if somebody hasn't done the appropriate maths at an early age, it may be very difficult for them up to upskill later. But is it possible to get people later in later stage career to then move into a field that you need? Yes, absolutely. So I think there's a number of answers to that really good question. One of them is, you know, I told you through the Navigate program, we're taking people that might have had, you know, um, a medical research background and retraining them in areas um, entirely different. But it still uses the same fundamental cognitive capacity, skills and, and interest. At other levels, though, I think we can do things quite differently. And I know I've been talking recently to companies who are doing quite clever and disruptive things in the cyber area where everybody is hungry for workforce. So we don't have to be talking the PhD or the research workforce. You know, looking at young people who perhaps just didn't do the maths and science subjects for whatever reason, but do have that capacity, finding ways to identify it and finding means to bring them in to have meaningful work. You know, uh, one company I spoke to recently was giving young women working in retail the opportunity to apply for cyber entry pathways and finding extraordinary talent that just had made other choice choices aged 15, 16. Now, that's fascinating because another of the questions here that's just come in, what are you doing about the culture and defence that supports employers, especially young women? So, are there... Are there measures that are being undertaken now or more that can be done in the future to uh, look, encourage those young women? Culture is everything. Um, we have a very um, front of mind 
culture plan that really is a real, around inclusion and removing barriers um, to engagement for a diverse range of people. It is a very high priority for me personally and in fact was the reason we kicked off the Navigate program. We actually put out a signal saying it would be at least 40% women and by putting out that signal we got 43%. Okay, so I think there's a lot you can do, but that's not specifically culture. I'm just conscious we're short for time, but it is really important. It's something the whole of defence is cares a lot about, and I think it is changing. So that's that's great. So 40, 43 percent of the Navigate program were women. Correct. How big was the Navigate program? So the initial cohort, we took 70 out okay. of the 800 odd applicants. 800 applications. Nearly so that's great too. Applicants, yep. Okay, so many things to talk about. I think geopolitics to workforce. Uh, there was plenty there. Uh, please join me in thanking Tanya Munro for a great session, I thought. Very thought-provoking. Thank you. Thank you. The internationalisation of higher education through mobility of students has grown considerably over the past few years. They add to the skilled workforce and create meaningful connections. But also, there have been instances of documentary frauds at the time of admission. To eliminate that, a thorough background check is required by the institutions. This is where the need of a trusted credential evaluation partner, CredEvaluate Global, arises, who follows due diligence, ensuring the onboarding of only genuine candidates to top institutions. Specializing in assessing frauds, Cred Evaluate Global conducts due diligence using AI-powered software platform Cred Evaluate Assessment Central to assess the credentials of the applicants. We consistently achieve operational excellence in faster turnaround time with high quality, integrity, ethics and transparency. We endeavour to become the trusted and preferred compliance partner to the global institutions.